Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, past, present, future, collectively or individually, anything that seems timely to us. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something how the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand changed everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of the McCartney Legacy series, which is forthcoming, volume one due in October 2022. I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. He also has his own YouTube channel, KenMichaelsRadio.com, which is packed with Beatles-related interviews, and you can check them all out when you're not watching this. Hey, Ken, how's it going? Good, Alan. Looking forward to today's show. Yeah. And also Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUV FM 90.7 in the New York area since 1984. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. And he'll give you more information as well at the end. Um, Darren, how's it going? How are you? I'm doing all right. And there's something to look forward to the end of the show, just to hear, (laughs) you know, the same thing over again about me. Hey, but listen, one, happy holiday. Won't be four hours, <laughs> 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 probably. Um, so, um, as we mentioned at the end of the last show, um, the last show we recorded, we recorded on the day of uh, the anniversary of George Harrison's death, twentieth um, anniversary, and. Um, but we needed to talk about Get Back last time. So we've sort of postponed our tribute to George until today. And that's what we'll be doing um, as soon as Ken finishes the news. Ken? (laughs) You make me want to do it real quick, (laughs) the way way you just said that. But uh, we have quite a bit to get to here. First of all, the Beatles' Let It Be album has been supercharged by the showing of the docuseries Get Back, and it has catapulted from number 80 to number 19 on Billboard's top 200 album charts. But it also sits on top of the top rock albums charts from Billboard. And at the same time, the Beatles are exploding with other titles of theirs. Abbey Road is at number three. The One compilation is at number 26 and the White Album is at number 45. It's a different chart from Billboard's Top 200, which encompasses everything, every genre of music. This is strictly the rock album charts, but hey, Let It Be is at number one there. Pretty impressive. Not bad. And in other chart news on the British singles charts, Christmas is back in full swing with Paul's Wonderful Christmas Time at number 29 there and John and Yoko's Happy Christmas at number 35. But both those holiday classics have yet to reappear on Billboard's Hot 100 here in America. And speaking of classic Christmas songs, Wonderful Christmas Time has been covered by the very popular a cappella group Pentatonix. It's on their new album called Evergreen. And you can find many performances of the group doing Paul's song on YouTube. Uh, We just found out right before the start of this program As a matter of fact, there is a brand new video that's been done for George Harrison's classic, My Sweet Lord, and it's debuting on December the 15th at 9 a.m. Pacific time on George's YouTube channel. So can't say anything about it since we haven't seen it yet, but we'll talk about it in the next show. I understand that Fred Armisen is in the video. Uh, Also, to mark the 50th anniversary of the uh, release of the first Wings album, Wildlife, and that was December the 7th, the anniversary, Universal Music and MPL have announced that, like the first McCartney album and Ram, they'll reissue, they'll be issuing a 50th anniversary half-speed mastered vinyl edition, and that's coming out February 4th next year. Uh, While for many years the album had a reputation for being one of McCartney's weakest albums, it has gained uh, somewhat in stature 
with tracks like Dear Friend, Tomorrow, Some People Never Know, and the title track getting more appreciation. The reissue on vinyl was cut at half speed at Abbey Road Studios using a high resolution transfer of the original 1971 master tapes. And just in time to celebrate Wildlife's 50th anniversary, a brand new recording was made of Some People Never Know from the team that brought us the tribute to Ram album, Ram On. That's Fernando Perdomo and Denny Sywell, the original drummer on Ram, and also the first drummer for Wings who played on the Wildlife album. On this new version, Denny plays the original snare and cymbal he used on the original recording, and Fernando plays really everything else, guitars, bass, keyboards, and percussion, and Adrian Bourgeois handles all the vocals. You can stream and download the track for just $1 at Fernando's Bandcamp page. Also, Paul's Wings Bass sold at a gigantic auction of guitars and other memorabilia to aid Music Rising. That's a charity that's started by uh, U2's The Edge and producer Bob Ezrin that helps New Orleans musicians impacted by COVID-19 and by Hurricane Ida. Paul's bass sold for $471,900, breaking the auction price record for a bass guitar. With special thanks to two of our listeners, Kevin Tobin and Adam Wobdken, uh, we learned that Ringo Starr is on a new charity album that's been released called Songs from Quarantine Volume 2, released by the Music Health Alliance Corporation. It includes 14 songs from various artists to benefit the Music Health Alliance, and that's an organization that offers support to the music community nationwide, including critical mental health and COVID-19 resources, in addition to access to healthcare, medicines, diagnostic tests, health-related debt relief, and more. Ringo has covered the 50s rocker. See you later, alligator. That was a hit for Bill Haley and his comments. So what that means is that on his last EP, he covered Rock Around the Clock. So he actually has covered two Bill Haley songs all within a couple of months being released. This album is available digitally through Rodney Crowell's Bandcamp page. Okay. Uh, more news. This is actually very big news. Um, we're very proud to announce that a friend of ours and colleague uh, Ken Womack will be releasing two books on the Beatles road manager, friend and confidant, Mal Evans. The first volume of which is a full length biography on Mal coming out in 2023. The second will include Evans's uh, diaries, manuscripts, and numerous other artifacts from the family archives that's coming out in 2024. According to its press release, for decades, the mystery surrounding Evans' treasure trove of unreleased material has left Beatle fans and music historians alike longing for a glimpse into the life and times of this most devoted friend among their inner circle. Mel Evans is also seen as a central figure in the footage in Peter Jackson's uh, docuseries, Get Back. So that's very exciting to hear that we'll find out what was in Mal's archives. Yeah. We'll still have to wait a few years. Um, let me just say that um, Ken's publisher for that and his editor are the same as ours for McCartney Legacy. Ah, so never knew that. They're getting to be quite the little Beatles imprint, apparently. <laughs> and will or, be bigger than ever mm. with uh, those two books on Mal and your series with Adrian. Mm -hmm. Uh, while we are about to do a tribute show, looking back on the life and legacy of George Harrison, it's a bit ironic that a major name in George's life, Dennis O'Brien, passed away. Dennis was the co-founder with George for Handmade Films, one of the top film companies in the UK, which operated from 1978 until 1991. Dennis was also George's business manager. Their partnership actually ended in court. O'Brien was ordered by a California judge in 1996 to pay George damages of $11 million for alleged mismanagement of the company finances. And three months before George died, a judge rejected George's effort to stop O'Brien from declaring bankruptcy. 
Okay, a few more news items here. Ringo Starr's concert at the Paramount Theater in Asbury Park, New Jersey, scheduled for May 31st next year to kick off his concert tour, has been canceled. The show's promoter, AM Productions, is saying that the operators of the venue, Madison Marquette, report that the theater is being closed out of safety concerns and other issues raised from this past August. Refunds will be available at the point of purchase. Should everything return back to normal after delays from COVID, the first concert for Ringo next year would be June 2nd at the Wang Theater in Boston. Also, thanks to my wife, Joanne. She let me know about this news item. Joe Walsh of the Eagles will host his fifth annual Vets Aid concert on December the 18th. The live stream will feature the debut of brand new music with performances from Joe Walsh and the band, along with special guests, including Ringo Starr. All net proceeds from this event will go directly to veteran services charities. And to date, Vets Aid has raid near, uh, raised nearly $1.8 million to organizations that support veterans and their families. Also, we will close our news with the sad uh, announcement about the passing of Michael Nesmith of the Monkees at the age of 78. He definitely was a pioneer who um, integrated country with rock and roll. And that certainly is evident on Monkees records. And he was certainly a brilliant musician and songwriter. And I'm not sure how much the two of you appreciated the Monkees, but um, Apart from that, he was very much involved with the show. He, he was a pioneer in the video world. He had a program called Pop Clips, which uh, mixed videos with commentary from a VJ, which really was the start of what became MTV. We also know um, that he was in the video for A Day in the Life. Mm -hmm. And he, he did a really nice tribute song called I'll Remember You, which I've been very proud to play on my radio show, Every Little Thing. And it's very different because it links um, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers with the Beatles, making a parallel that both were tops in their field. Fred and Ginger, the best dancing team, and the Beatles, the greatest musical team. And in, in the song, uh, Michael says, John, my friend, you were the best by far. It's a really touching tribute song. And um, I strongly suggest you check that out if you've never heard it before. You can find it on YouTube. So any of you guys want to say anything about Mike Nesmith? I, I, I grew up, you know, I caught the monkeys. I guess it was reruns by the time, you know, I was, I was old enough to be able to watch them and was always a fan of theirs, um, kind of a fan from afar. I don't pretend to be a hardcore fan or overly knowledgeable uh, about them uh, and uh, the intricacies of what they did. Mm. Uh, a little bit of WFUV uh, was exposed to some of the um, back catalog of Mike Nesmith's. Um, you know, we tended um, for a period of time at the station to be like sort of a roots, uh, America, have a roots Americana format. Mm. Uh, and there were occasions where, you know, I'd spin a Mike Nesmith tune. Um, so uh, it was just, you know, I know the monkeys are enormously successful, uh, enormously popular. And, um, you know, the fans are hardcore, to say the least. And so it was very sad uh, that another piece of our childhood uh, is gone. And it was sounded like it was sudden, and uh, I heard natural causes. I don't know if they've come out with any more information. There's natural causes. I've also heard heart failure. Mm -hmm. He did have a quadruple bypass okay. not that long ago. Um, but from what I understand from people who worked with with Mike and Mickey on this last tour, um, they knew that he was ill. Mm -hmm. And oh, really? and they thought that he would pass, but they didn't think it would be so soon after the tour ended. Really? Yeah. The tour ended, I think, on November 14th. So that's like a month ago today. And uh, mm. um, as we record this, um, 
my my one interaction with him was um, after George Martin died. Um, I had done the obit in the Times, and then the Times asked me to write a. a a piece about, you know, maybe five tracks that George Martin produced that show why he was so important to the Beatles. And I, I can't remember which five I chose. Strawberry Fields would have been one of them. And um, <clears throat> uh, and Mike Nesmith posted it on Facebook and wrote, um, I don't normally post um, newspaper articles here, but this guy got it. And I was really very happy with wow. that. <laughs> um, so I, I just sent him a note saying thanks. <laughs> um, but that was that. And uh, mm. yeah. That's cool. Mm. Very nice. He acknowledged you. And in my other uh, podcast show, Talk More Talking, he acknowledged Kid O'Toole, mm -hmm. who recognized the fact that Michael had done something that was a combination of, you know, um, a video and an album together. You know, he was he was known for doing um, what was the name of it? Elephant parts or television yeah. parts mm -hmm. where parts. every every <laughs> song on the album that was a video for. Mm -hmm. And it was also mixed with comedy and bits. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, very pioneering, too. But um, Kit was aware of that and she wrote an article about it. And and Mike evidently was aware of that. So uh, very nice to know that he stays on top of these things and notices when other people are doing something that, you know, he admires their work. So very nice right there. In fact, and someone for, else reposted um, a, a note like that, that he wrote um, to Alison Boron. Um, I don't know if you know Alison, but um, she's been doing a lot of really good work and she had been a student in my music criticism class at NYU. And he basically talked about how, you know, it's you never know with journalists, but she turned up and she had done her homework and she knew what she was doing. And, and she wrote what actually happened in the interview. So I was, I was sort of proud of that too, by, uh, you know, association in a way. Um, Cause she was, she was very good in the class too. And all the stuff that she wrote about in the class was, you know, classic rock kind of stuff, mm. which, you know, for someone of that generation, um, um, I was happy to see because uh, when I played some Beatles things in the class for them to um, analyze or compare with other versions or whatever, there were, you know, there were somewhere, uh, you know, I, I would play I Am the Walrus and asked if anybody had never heard it before and half the hands yeah. went up in the class. It was, was mm. shocking to me. But, um, but Allison was great and she's, uh, and, and she sort of, you know, carved out a nice little career for herself and got this note from Mike Nesmith. So, uh, so mm. great. Very nice. Mm. Yeah. So that's all the news that I have this time. Okay. So on to our tribute to George. Um, <clears throat> during the Beatles years, um, you know, I have to admit slightly guiltily that, you know, while I paid attention to all of them as one would. Um, I probably was more focused on Lennon and McCartney as the principal songwriters. Um, and particularly during George's, um, George's period of writing Indian inspired music. Um, at the time, I didn't know really what to make of that, uh, you know, when I was 12, 13. <laughs> um, you know, and ultimately came to terms with it. And, uh, you know, but I, I, I think I um, listen to George a lot more closely now and value his contributions a lot more than I did. I mean, not to mention that we know a lot more now about how he did what he did than we did when the records were just coming out. For instance, the backwards guitar on um, I'm Only Sleeping about how he, uh, um, you know, painstakingly wrote down the notes that he wanted to, to sound in the solo and then figured out what they'd be backwards. And then they played the tape backwards and he did it and they spent apparently hours doing that. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we, we also, you know, we all knew that it was George playing the intro to And I Love Her, but, um, you know, it's really only been 
since the Scorsese documentary that, you know, we've had it directly from Paul saying, yeah, George did this, George wrote this, you know, and he's elaborated on it since, you know, talking about how, uh, you know, we talked about maybe wanting a, an intro and George just coming up with this. Um, I personally feel, and I know that, that there are people who don't feel this way, uh, but I personally feel that he should have gotten a writer credit for that because you could argue that that little thing is really just a matter of arrangement. Um, but what undercuts that argument is the fact that whenever you hear a cover of And I Love Her, it includes that. So that actually is part of the composition of the song and he should have gotten, it should be McCartney Harrison, you know? Um, mm. So just things like that. But um, that's a very and, good point. Mm. I just wanted to say that's an excellent point right there, Alan. But if you're going to give someone a songwriting credit for arrangement, you can give so much to George Martin. <laughs> well, to right. Beatles songs. Uh, you well, know? OK, but, you know, when someone does a cover of something George Martin orchestrated, they don't tend to include his orchestration in the cover. That's Whereas true. you're not going to hear a cover of And I Love Her that doesn't have bum 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 yeah. it's just part of the song I, you know i see it as more than arrangement i see it as composition um but yeah you know if you're talking about arrangement strictly arrangement yeah then the writer credits for these things could go crazy but in this case i think it was more than just arrangement but so ken you just, wanted to um start with yeah. uh, a general overview of george in the beatles yeah, sure. I mean, what I'd like to say, I think, to a lot of people is going to be common sense. Um, the Beatles are so unique in many ways, but the number of bands that we've had in the history of rock and roll where every single member can sing a lead vocal and has done so, and every member has written songs, even though Ringo only wrote two, um, it's very rare. I think it's under 1%. And as I've said many times, each of the Beatles had uh, very successful solo careers where they all stood out on their own. And I think it added so much to the Beatles. I know that it mattered a lot to Brian Epstein in the very beginning when the Beatles were doing their deck audition recordings and also the BBC recordings to include George along with John and Paul. Yeah, it was a strength to have John and Paul for vocals, but it added a whole new dimension to have George in there as well, singing lead vocals. And a lot of people, I'm, I'm sure, when they studied the Beatles, are surprised that um, certainly on the BBC recordings, there's a lot more George there than they thought there would be doing a lead vocal. So when you've got four lead vocalists in a band and four of them are writing, uh, even though Ring only did a few, it, it just adds so much to the band, it, it makes it even more of a collaborative effort. Unlike you, Alan, when I was growing up as a little kid hearing the Beatles music, I took it all in and didn't think to myself, you know, this is really led by John and Paul, even, even if it was, mm -hmm. you know, I just looked at Don't Bother Me and I Need You and Tax Man is that they're all Beatles songs, mm -hmm. you know, but um, I think it, it it really made a huge difference. The most interesting bands that we've had, I mean, to me are bands where there's more of a collaboration. You know, how many bands can you think of where every member takes a lead vocal outside of the Beatles and the Monkees <laughs> uh, or Badfinger? Um, I'm not sure if every member of the Eagles has done a, a lead vocal, um, but there's so few and far between. And um, it helped to make the Beatles far more interesting. And um, yeah, there's all that we could talk about George as a guitar player and what he brought to the band as well, if you want me to do that now. But um, I think it makes a huge difference when you're talking about a band when each member contributes so much. Hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't saying I just focused on John and Paul. It's just that right. you know, you're going through the, the song list on each album and, you know, okay, Lennon McCartney, Lennon McCartney, Lennon McCartney, <laughs> Harrison, Lennon McCartney, right. Lennon McCartney. You know, so those are the ones that, that you, you know, and you try and figure out who wrote what and all that stuff, you know. Um, 
Yeah. So Darren, I think when I when I started out, I just looked at them as Beatles songs. Sure. I really didn't isolate everything as this is a Lennon song and this is a McCartney song. In the very beginning, I didn't. Hmm. Darren. Yes. You want to you talk about George's <laughs> place within the Beatles um, generally? Yeah. I mean, in this instance, because I'm the youngest of the three here. Um. Find, learning, and I've talked about this in the past, learning about the Beatles um, in, after they had broken up, they were already, it was history. Uh, I was growing up and the soundtrack to my youth was the solo stuff. And for what, some reason I gravitated to McCartney first and foremost, but I also gravitated to George. Um, and so I, I already, as I'm figuring this all out as I'm learning uh, about the Beatles, it, it, George's place is already established. Um, and from day one, I looked at George as being a Beatle, not, uh, you know, not the, you know, the songwriter struggling to come out from under John and Paul's shadow. Um, and even though the amount of songs credited to John, to Lennon McCartney, dwarf the Harrison compositions, they always still seemed to, to my ears to carry such weight, those songs, they were so great, that you just didn't notice that there was 10 songs and eight were Lennon McCartney, and two were Harrison. Those two Harrison songs uh, uh, packed a punch that, you know, it just, it, it just seemed, it was one. The whole thing was one, I think is what I'm saying. It was Beatles. It didn't matter, Lennon, McCartney, Harrison. Um, and that's pretty remarkable, actually. And, you know, talking about the band um, as a whole, uh, what's the chances of talents like John Lennon and Paul McCartney coming together? Oh, and they've got a guy here playing guitar who uh, might be a little behind, but is going to blossom into a writer that I feel often was writing on par with John and Paul. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I really believe that George was, especially by the end of the 60s, capable of coming out with stuff that held its own up against what John and Paul were coming, if not even top them from time to time mm -hmm. on quality. I mean, there's no way to measure or gauge that, but you can make the argument that some of the songs, especially now that we've seen uh, the Get Back documentary, some of the songs that George was bringing to the table that for one reason or another got pushed to the side, whether, you know, whatever reason, each particular song got pushed to, pushed to the side. And um, those songs definitely hold up, if not exceed, especially Lennon's output. Uh, at that point in time. Um, you know, if you look at how it seemed like Abbey Road might have been McCartney dominated album uh, in a way it is. Um, well, if you take my sweet, um, sorry, uh, Here Comes the Sun and Something, George's contributions to, to Abbey Road and cherry pick some of the other songs that we know from All Things Must Pass, like the title track, uh, songs that existed at that point in the Beatles' final days, um, those George songs would have would have held their own and would have been perfect side by side with what Paul was coming up with for Abbey Road. Uh, and 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 I now I'm thinking as I say this that I, it really sounds like I'm knocking John's output at that time, which I'm not. I do think though uh, that by the very end of the Beatles, Paul was probably hitting his stride and. Uh, not John, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Where I'm getting at there was like, it just seemed as though Paul was really kicking it on all cylinders uh, and had more material and was just pumping out tracks. Right. Um, if so that then one it, scene where John yeah. says, we've done all of mine, um, both of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I mean, you know, in a long career, I mean, it's like baseball. I always go back a lot of times to uh, use baseball as a, as a way to compare I mean, if you look at a team that's got uh, um, a great pitching staff, not every single guy on that pitching staff is going to be uh, Walter Johnson and Cy Young. You're going to have some other guys that are complementary parts, but there's going to be a time 
when that complementary part is going to excel to the point where they're the, you know, they're going to have the big old star season. And it's remarkable that the Beatles, that Paul and John came together and, and George happened to be there. And then when all was said and done, the guy considered the best drummer out of Liverpool uh, joins them as well. Mm -hmm. um, it just, unfortunately for George, he was a little slow to blossom. Uh, was it because he, he was younger, younger? too? Yeah. I'm sorry? Because yeah, he was younger too, you know? I yeah, mean, yeah. Just... I mean, that could have been one reason why. So Paul and John hit the ground running and George needed a few steps to catch up, but he caught up. Only thing, by that time, it was, there was just not enough room uh, to have three monster writers come to the fore. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, by the end of the Beatles run, what Harrison was coming up with was in my mind on par with the guys who are considered two of the greatest pop songwriters. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you want to consider them a team, which they really weren't. You know, you'll hear sometimes Early people on. say Lennon McCartney, always Lennon McCartney. Mm -hmm. um, when in reality, we know that a lot of it was McCartney and Lennon separate, but Harrison uh, held his own in that in that regard. Um, so, you know, often when we talk about the Beatles, we there's like footnotes going in the background. So that you know, just before when I quoted John saying we've done all mine, um, both of them, you know, he also brought "Give Me Some Truth," "Mean Mr. Mustard." Polythene Pam, uh, Madman, Watching Rainbows. There were, you know, if you listen to all the Nagras, John has parts of whole bunches of songs going. And if you, you know, if you say, well, okay, a part of a song isn't, you know, a song. Well, you know, Paul walked in without Get Back and came out with Get Back right. in those sessions. So, you know, they they could have chosen any of John's and finished them and 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 had more than you know, just the two, but, you know, George brought a stack of songs to the Let It Be sessions. You know, we, we only saw in, in Peter Jackson's film, we only saw, you know, a little bit of something and a little bit of um, All Things Must Pass, um, you know, plus Four you. You Blue and, you know, um, but the thing is he, he went through quite a bunch of them. And there was one thing that we saw the conversation where he's talking to John about how I'm thinking of doing a, a solo album. Um, as I remember from listening to the Nagras in various bootlegs, um, there was, he, he ran through a bunch of the songs too at a certain point. And, uh, you know, the, there was, there was a lot, you know, he actually brought in more finished songs or almost finished songs than John did at that point. Um, you know, I also think that he had, you know, he got sort of a raw deal in a way. I mean, he was younger, okay, fine. And, um, you know, and at that age, it may make more of a difference than it did when they were finishing up, you know, um, and all in their 20s. <clears throat> but, um, you know, if you think about it, one their very first original recording, um, uh, in spite of all the danger, was McCartney Harrison. And Paul says, well, you know, it's just because he wrote the solo and we didn't really realize that you don't give someone a writer credit for writing the solo. But whatever it was, <laughs> the two of them came up with that song. John isn't involved in it at all, doesn't get a writer credit. It's McCartney Harrison. Then they go to Hamburg. They make a bunch of recordings with Tony Sheridan. And the one original is Lennon Harrison, Cry for a Shadow. Okay. So George is in there at the beginning. Granted, you know, for instrumental stuff, he, you know, neither of those are a lyric contribution. Um, and maybe he was a little bit slower on the lyrical side of things. But um, before they even started, he had a co-writer credit on two songs. And, uh, you know, we, what exactly went on with the Lennon-McCartney partnership and whether it would be Lennon-McCartney, McCartney-Lennon, whether it would be whoever wrote the song principally would be first or not, or, you know, there's, there's a, a lot about that in, um, in Tune In, um, how they came up with that. But 
also in there is that they thought about, do we include George in this? And they decided not to. And I wonder if deciding not to was necessarily fair or deciding that it only could be Lennon McCartney. It couldn't be, you know, look, there's a Lennon McCartney Starkey, what goes on. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of tracks that are all four of them. But, you know, it could have been McCartney Harrison for And I Love Her, and it could have been, um, you know, there could have been a lot of different variations of credits. I mean, Fixing a Hole could have been McCartney uh, Evans, you know, because Mal mm -hmm. contributed to that. And, uh, you know, and Mal actually, there, there was talk of giving him a credit or Getting, giving him a royalty or something, and it never really came about. Will I, I think, find out more about that from, from Ken Womack when he publishes his book. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, but to get back to the, the main point, which is I think that, that George, uh, you know, it could have been divided up a little bit more equitably. Um, and also the fact that they're all bringing in songs and okay, he wasn't writing as quickly as the others early on. Um, and so he sort of swamped by them in a way. But I think if he had a little more encouragement early on, you know, he, he talks about how uh, he's not sure whether Don't Bother Me is really a song at all. That's the way he puts it in I Me Mine. Um, but uh, it's a song, it's a good song. I always liked that song, you know, from when it Me first too. came out. That was um, the first, right? That's the first Harrison that was yeah. released. Yeah. A sign of things to come. Because mm -hmm. that's a great song. Mm -hmm. And it's your first. Yeah. You know. yeah. yeah. You know, it's it's interesting because you know, I was just saying when I grew up as a little kid, they were all just Beatles songs. And later on, you're able to distinguish what's a Lennon song, what's a McCartney song, what's a Harrison song. But it definitely from the from the get-go, George had a style that was all his own. Mm -hmm. Because Don't Bother Me doesn't sound, to me at least, like anything else that was on with the Beatles. It doesn't sound like a Lennon McCartney song. It's got that negative <laughs> attitude from George even early on in his career. Um, yeah, he had a style that was his own from, from the beginning. And he did as a guitarist, too. I mean, you know, we used to read early on in their interviews, um, John saying how much he hated trad jazz, for instance. I mean, that was one of his things. He used to say that. Who knows what he really thought about it or what he considered trad jazz, whatever it is. And yet at the very beginning of All I've Got to Do, which is only on their second album in England, um, George begins that song with an E augmented chord with an added ninth and an added 11th, an outright jazz chord. And it's John's song. So, you know, there are all these little things that you, you sort of wonder when you listen to that. I mean, he must have um, he must have really liked that chord. It really only happens at the beginning of that song. The rest of the song is much more conventional chords. Um, mm. But he, you know, he, he must have been into it. And you kind of wonder whether without John, you know, trash talking jazz all the time, not all the time, you know. Um, whether George might have headed more in that direction, learn more of those bizarre chords with the, you know, extra, you know, uh, non-diatonic tones and things and, and uh, could have become a much more interesting guitarist and just in terms of the kind of chording he did. Um, not saying that he wasn't interesting. Um, I'm just saying that that was a direction that he appeared to be creeping towards and then, you know, pretty much stopped it. Um, you know, so I think, um, as a guitarist and also as a singer, he really brought a lot to the group. Um, even if you consider, you know, before he was really writing or before he was really writing much, you know, they gave him, um, do you want to know a secret? And I'm happy just to dance with you. And you know, <laughs> the songs, excuse me, those songs, are really, you know, he didn't write them, but they're totally George in a way. They're, they're absolutely suited to his voice. And his voice was the one, you know, more than the others that sort of retained the Liverpool accent in a way. You could hear it coming through his singing. 
there was just something about the way he phrased things and the way he said things um, that sounded it where, where you could tell a bit more of where he came yeah. from than the others. You know, the others were just singing in in singing accent. You know, it was, <laughs> it was just just plain. Um, uh, so, but but George had that character, um, you know, and you hear that also, obviously, in a lot of the BBC tracks that, uh, you know, a lot of the BBC tr tracks that he sang, they never recorded an awful lot of the George's, actually. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's where to go for that. And it's a, you know, I really liked his voice in in those days, well, all through, but um, but it was that, you know, different character that he brought to his phrasing and in the way he said words and sang words. Um, it's just a, you know, it's, it's not something you necessarily think about consciously all that much, but it's just a nice little touch that, um, you know, expands the sound of the group further, it, you know, when you take into account all four of them. Also, when it comes to singing, he doesn't get nearly the amount of credit that he deserves for the, the fine harmony work that he did mm. with the Beatles. Mm -hmm. I mean, John Paul and George did great harmony work together. And from what I understand, for, from you know, people who study uh, singing and, and um, you know, different parts, when you're doing three part harmony, it's often the middle part that's the most difficult to sing because your ear automatically hears the main melody or the higher melody, and you've got to concentrate on what's sandwiched in between. And most of the time that was George doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you hear songs like this boy, or um, certainly because, or yes, it is, you know, the harmonies there are just extraordinary and right. they blend so well together. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, something else about George, if I could switch to guitar playing, mm -hmm. Uh, where it might have been easy to kind of overlook um, George as the um, as a musician, as the guitarist. Uh, he's a guy who embraces what, to me, uh, the non-musician, uh, the ability to embrace and understand Indian music, I mean, which essentially is classical, at least I've heard what Ravi Shankar did was Indian classical music. And here he's studying under a world renowned classical musician and learning an instrument, the sitar, that's got to be a, a, a just incredibly complicated to learn. And it's George Harrison, who very quietly in his own Harrison sort of way without, you know, getting much attention uh, is front and center that's not actually accurate front and center. He's being very subtle, very quietly, not front and center, um, really expanding the sound of the Beatles uh, through his now, uh, his growing knowledge of Indian music and ability to play the sitar and even right away, fairly quickly, able to oversee an album, Wonderwall music of largely made up of this foreign uh, musical style it's it's George that's the guy who that did that if that if that makes sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. also it's extraordinary to think and and we say this a lot about John and Paul how they wrote these songs these absolutely brilliant songs very mature songs at such a young age yeah. and if you're talking about George in particular to think that he wrote something that was certainly new to him to write love you too for example yeah that's 1966 so george would have been 20 23 right yeah then and 23 or 24 for within you without you very complicated stuff right there um to be able to learn as much about indian music the different instrumentation eastern philosophy to be able that to do mixed. that well, too. Yeah. So young. Not he just absorbed. to add a sitar as a, as a spice in the background. Which and the Norwegian wood was. You know, but it's, okay. it's a big jump to go from Norwegian wood. Right. Where the sitar is, you know, 
a very important instrument that added a lot to the song to a full blown Indian song like Love You Too was, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I, it, it boggles the mind that the Beatles were able to do this yeah. when they were so young. And add to this the inner light and to what yep. you were just saying. Uh, arguably the most obscure released Beatles song, I think. It would be a toss up between that and You Know My Name, Look Up the Number. Yep. Uh, but the inner light is pure brilliance. I mean, that's a beautiful song. Uh, and and they and and that was you know George. I'm not doing the math. I've done enough math on this show already. Now, uh, at what 23? 20, not even 24. 23. Something like that. Songs that he wrote during the Beatle years. Yeah. That were released by the Beatles anyway. Not counting everything else, like Not Guilty and. No, no, no. And... Yeah, no. I'm talking about at the at the point that. Like, because the inner light was sort of written, and and uh, no, the backing track was recorded at the same time as the Wonderwall music. Right. Uh, mm. So you're talking now the beginning of '68, and George isn't; he's still 22. It no, 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 yet. no, 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 no. '68, he would have been by that time. You're talking February with the inner light. Um, he would have been 24. Four, not 25 yet. If, well, February would have turned 25. This is why we do a podcast about Beatles and music. And uh, not math. <laughs> not math. Or, you know, if this was a math podcast, you wouldn't be coming to us. Yeah. You know, I count. There's my math right here. One, mm -hmm. two. I think this, in a way, leads on to uh, another aspect of George, which is that, um, you know, his personal interests we're not just sort of following along the older guys in the group's personal interests. You know, he, he had his own thing. Um, he got interested in, well, Indian music, and he got interested in Indian spirituality. And in those fields, he sort of led them. I mean, <clears throat> You know, none of them uh, necessarily, you know, became a uh, an Indian music expert or a sitar player or anything like that. Uh, although I, I, I bet Paul can pick out a tune on one. Um, but um, you know, this was his thing. It wasn't like uh, you know him just sort of you know panning quickly after John and Paul. He had his own interest that. What turned out to be a lifelong interest, you know, um, his uh, his fascination with Indian spirituality. But you know, he, I think he kind of melded it with his own background. Um, you know, if you look in uh, in I Me Mine, there uh, I think there's a letter to his mother where he's explaining his interest in Indian spirituality and how it doesn't in any way negate um, his Christian upbringing, um, you know, which is kind of an interesting perspective. And, you know, if you read the things he said, um, and I should just hold this up to remind um, oh. uh, listeners and viewers, uh, we, um, we spoke with Ashley Kahn when this book came out. This is a book of um, George Harrison interviews, absolutely worth getting. Um, and, you know, he talks a lot about spirituality in there. And basically, you know, he just took the point of view that, you know, okay, I, I was a pop star, big deal. The most important thing in life is to, you know, get to know God and from the Hindu point of view, not have to keep going through the cycle of reincarnation because you perfect your life as much as you can and maybe not have to come back again. Um, you know, I'm not a Hindu and I don't, you know, I, I don't know how much I subscribe to the things he said or not, but um, I found it really always very fascinating to read what he had to say because he was committed to this and he believed in it. And he had also a way of explaining it so that, you know, Western kids listening to rock and roll could understand if they were willing to put in the time 
to listen to what he had to say and maybe do some other reading. Um, I think I, I, I talked a bit about that it, when we talked about um, the All Things Must Pass album, the, you know, the degrees to which he got me to do some of that other reading. Um, and it's just fascinating stuff, you know? I mean, it doesn't really matter what you believe or don't believe, whether it's for you, whether it's not for you. These are ideas and they're big ideas and they're ideas worth exploring. And, you know, George, I, I think really did um, a service to all of us willing to listen mm -hmm. um, in bringing them to our attention and being so serious about it. And, and also to basically give the perspective of, you know, being a pop star isn't everything. It isn't even anything, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. pretty much the way he looked at it. Um, so there's that side of him that um, I, I am really actually grateful for, you know, apart from the music. There's all of that, you know, and that is a way that he, you know, matured in a way differently than the others did, you know, um, and he talked about it a lot. It's in those interviews in the Ashley Kahn book, um, and it's definitely worth looking into. And Simply isn't it an interesting topic? It's so extraordinary. I use that word a lot that he's discovering all this stuff at such a young age. Mm -hmm. You know, just about every single pop star, or rock star, a young man in his early 20s, you know, would probably be having a very indulgent lifestyle, you know, probably thinking about getting as many women as they can, you know, and um, not that George didn't have a healthy. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you know, <laughs> but the fact that he's realizing there's more to life than that, mm -hmm. and he realized it in his early 20s. And beyond whether or not his fans who the Beatles and his solo music really um, accepted Indian music or enjoyed Indian music, it also introduced people to Eastern philosophy and also to meditation. You know, a lot of people probably wouldn't have started meditating if it wasn't for George, you know, yeah. you know introducing that to the world through the Beatles first. Mm -hmm. So... You know, we talk a lot about this is the start of world music in a way. And yeah. uh, apart from what George brought to the Beatles with Indian music, it was also at a time, certainly George was learning a lot from Ravi Shankar. Ravi was making a very big name for himself, being at, uh, you know, the Monterey Pop Festival. And so his name was, was certainly getting more and more, more attention. So, um, yeah, George was such a big part of that you know, and how he influenced us and not just in the music, but also in everything else that has to do with Eastern philosophy and culture. I don't know, you mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned world music because I was thinking, and I was just looking up here because uh, I know Brian Jones did uh, uh, an album of, uh, with a Moroccan ensemble, I think. The Pipes of Jujuka. Yeah. I know a few people that used to be in the pipes of Jujuka. No, I'm kidding. Um, but um, but Brian Jones did record that later in 68. Hmm. And, uh, and that was after George would have been working on uh, the Wonderwall music album. Uh, so it's not a stretch to say that that was, in fact, the first what would be defined as world music album where uh, a Western musician uh, embraced you know, I don't know. I can't think of another well, example. It, Alan has one right on the tip of his tongue. I could see it. Yeah, the thing <laughs> is, I think you know, when we say this is the start of world music, I, I think we have to clarify that this is the start of world music in the rock and roll world. Right. Outside mm. the rock right, and yeah. roll world. Mm -hmm. And especially in London at the time, there were, you know, societies of Asian music kind of things that, that were bringing over Ravi Shankar and bringing over other musicians and the great classical guitarist Julian Bream in I think 1962 did a, a duet with um, um, it was a Sarod player um, and hmm. uh, you know and, and, and that was on BBC TV so actually George would have had an opportunity to see that I, whether he did or not I don't know but it was you know there 
Um, so uh, there's another thing that, you know, another musical influence that George is responsible for in the Beatles. And uh, we were talking about when we talked about Mike Nesmith and his bringing country music into rock. Um, George was doing that too. I mean, George was a big rockabilly guy. And, uh, you know, you listen to some of his early solos, you know, even his solo on, uh, you know, like All My Lovin' has a little rockabilly tinge. Um, I'm a loser. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he had that style mm. down and, uh, you know, it, he, he brought a bit of that into, into the Beatles that, that was an important part of the mix. Um, and also those are, you know, most of his BBC vocals are, are those kind of songs too. Um, you know, we know that, that Paul and, and John and Ringo uh, certainly were interested in rockabilly, but George was the one who seemed to incorporate it most into his style of playing. Um, so I, I just thought, you know, since we're talking about his world music, right. thing we, we should do that too. And another cool. thing is humor, you know, um, not so much in his Beatles songs, um, but later on, you know, he, when, when he wasn't answerable to anybody, uh, it's a bit more humorous and the, and the, the, the biggest, uh, expansion of that is really the traveling Wilburys, you know, that's kind of in a way, a, a comedy band sort of, I mean, they didn't do comedy, but their songs had clever, jokey little underpinnings a lot of the time. And you get the impression that a lot of that came from George. And it makes sense that George really was the Monty Python mm. uh, fan. Uh, right. So, you know, mm. their minds were working similarly. Um, but that's a good point about the humor. So many of George's albums have these songs that may on the surface, you know, not jump out as being humorous tunes, not like some, um, I'm drawing a blank on a song from 30, is it 33 and a third? No, soft, uh, I mean, so, um, from George Harrison, a song that's blatantly humorous on side one. Um, soft hearted Hannah? Hannah, that's, yeah, I, I, I had the title. Um, but there's more subtle things like, if you know the backstory to, what's going on with this song from 33 and a third. If mm -hmm. you don't know the, you know, the, or forgot that the lawsuit and bright tunes and right. uh, a lot of humor, incredible amount of cleverness in the, uh, in the lyrics on that song. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, another little aspect, another little uh, quality about George's work that really is brilliant and goes back to what I said early on about him being on par with, the songwriting prowess of Lennon and McCartney, that uh, he had all this uh, very um, kind of like, you know, this all these little secret weapons, these quiet little subtle nuances that he was uh, injecting into his music going back to the Beatles, um, you know, that didn't call attention to themselves. You had to go digging in there and there was a reason why he was the quiet Beatle, because even when he was slipping, you know, little, little, little bits of, uh, you know, brilliance, it wasn't like, you know, it, my brain's breaking. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it wasn't the like drain. bells and whistles, you know, calling yeah. attention. Great mm -hmm. solo coming, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It was always very understated. Right. And when I think about humor, I also think same album there, 33 and a third. I think of yeah. Cracker Box Palace right. and the video just to make those. Oh, videos, yeah, the video. Yeah, right. You know, for this song and, and, and the, Cracker Box Palace and True Love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jump Ahead, the video to Blow Away, mm -hmm. uh, which is a pretty funny one. And Jump Even Further Ahead, Got My Mind Set On You. Mm -hmm. um, I also, this is a jumping to his solo stuff being that we're uh, talking about a lot about it i've said this many times over the years probably on this show that of the four of them uh i've always thought george harrison's solo catalog was the most consistent of the four hmm. um john uh paul and ringo 
had peaks and valleys uh, in their solo career. Um, you know, a lot of people might say sometime in New York City was a low point for John uh, and imagine was a high point. Paul, whatever, you know, for me, it was give my regards to Broad Street Pipes of Peace, period. Um, but then there's, and then others don't like driving rain. McCartney had plenty of, Harrison was more, I think, even keel. I mean, there really weren't any valleys. There were peaks, solvings was pass. Um, but his solo catalog was consistently enjoyable. And even an album that somebody might think is a weak album in that catalog, there's a lot of musicians out there wish that they could come up with weak albums mm. like that and it be their, their master stroke. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was listening the other day to the album that if I had to pick one that I thought was maybe George's um, least impressive albums, Extra Texture, I was listening to it the other day. I'm going, you know, I'm starting to like not agree with myself anymore, you know, because there were things that now I'm like, wait a minute, this is not the uh, not the snoozer I thought it to be because there's little there's things happening on this album that, you know, even when maybe he wasn't that motivated or wasn't that into what he was doing, he's coming out with this great stuff. You know, these we should get you in two Zoom boxes and you can debate with yourself. <laughs> I debate with myself about a lot of things. <laughs> but the problem is when I don't beat when I don't win the debate, I always end up in an argument with myself. <laughs> but uh, you know, do you, do you see what I'm saying about the catalog? There's really any I mean, if you put Wonderwall music and electronic sound aside and start with all things must pass, I mean Harrison really didn't make a bum album. I love Wonderwall. Oh, I do I, too. I do too. I do too, but it's hard to kind of, it's like apples and oranges mm. um, to take those two albums. Uh, and a lot of people won't get, probably didn't get Wonderwall music or definitely not electronic sound. I actually also just recently listened to electronic sound quite possibly for the very first time from beginning to end. Mm. <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, I just like popped it on and just left it on. I thought, you know what, even something like this, got a little interesting from time to time and what was going on in there. But I, George's catalog to me was the, was the most consistent, you know, he, 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 and he had the album that some will say is, was the best of uh, all the solo albums, all things must pass in that mix. And, you know, in my mind, uh, Ken wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, I have my favorite. I have no problem with, anybody saying all things must pass is the best solo album but you, you know, would say it in the material my, world right that's my favorite because yeah. the songs do something for me they're yeah. deeply personal and I very mean, often i said, said it's your kind favorite of like, album of all of all time, all time you know yeah so. because i, I think I it says a lot that. about yeah i agree with you i mean for me my taste 33 and a third and living in the material world are are one, a, one B and one C, depending on what day of the week it is, behind mm. All Things Must Pass. Looking at All Things Must Pass as one huge body of work, and mm. I'll include Apple Jam in there. Yeah. You know, uh, to me, yeah. Apple Jam maybe weighs All Things Must Pass down a bit. Well, the two shorter albums, Living in the Material World and 33 and a Third, don't have that pulling it down. And therefore, in my mind, hold up with the best does that make sense what i'm saying i mean it, yeah well, you know what me, i mean yeah apple jam you can't make those a bonus you know i don't, no, I don't I know really i know it but it's there. there it's you know yeah uh if you want to be, sit down and listen from beginning to end you got to listen to all apple jam sit down and sit, finish listening to apple jam um i mean you know the george the self-titled album too to me is uh would be then you know right underneath though you know living in the material world and uh, 33 and a third. 33 and a fond of Con Trapo. Me too. At this point, we'll mention all of his albums. This <laughs> yeah. is what I mean. You yeah, know, he I'm does saying? have a small output. Um, that's a pity in a way. You know, I, I really think that he probably has lots and lots of demos and things that um, I'm wishing will come out while we are still here to hear them. <laughs> I always thought that. George was, oh, well, I didn't think it. I mean, I think it's safe to say that George was probably least interested in the whole showbiz thing. 
Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, so when, like, say, 1974 is winding down and he's uh, pushing to rehearse for a tour and to get an album out to go with the tour and it screws up his voice and the critics come. I mean, this George Harrison was a deity, according to the critics, just two years earlier. Mm. And now they're with the, they're so fast with their knives out to criticize the tour and to say, oh, Dark Horse was half baked and 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 then extra texture didn't get like widely embraced by the critics and i think that really affected george in a way that mm-hmm. he thought I, you know i don't really need to do this right um and he yeah. slowed down and then you know, he married olivia had danny now he's a dad then there's that little gap between 33 and the third and george harrison where music wasn't important and uh you know, I don't think the somewhere in England experience was that good where the record company sent him back to square one to <laughs> right. come up with another album. And uh, you know what? Here, what do I owe you? One more record? Here's Contrapo. I'm going to go plant some trees. I don't need this. Yeah. And that made his, you know, I think is what made that his uh, catalog smaller than it should have been. Could be. Well, or not think... as big as it could have been. But All I really this... love his response to yeah. getting... Um, somewhere in England sent back to him, giving them as a new addition to that album, Blood from a Clone, which yeah. <laughs> yeah. just slices yeah. the yeah. record industry. Is, you, know, is, you know, I'll teach you to send me back an album. And that, that part of it, I always thought was great. And they, they, that one, they let st- st- open the album up. You just got done telling a former Beatle that you didn't think the album's up to par. And he de- re-delivers the replacement with a knock. He's criticizing you and first track. There you go. Yep. And I think there are a lot of George fans who think the original Somewhere in England was better. Hmm. You know, there are songs on there that, uh, that I really treasure, you know, like Flying Hour especially, which has, I think, some commercial appeal. Not that it would have been a, a number one hit, but it, it would have gotten some attention. Could have been a top 40 hit. Wait. But... Um, yeah. Alan has it right there. No, I'm not sure. I, I don't think uh, I, I don't think he was yet doing uh, the CDs that came with these things. But of course, here is my uh, original I Me Mine. Nice. Um, that was that. Now that was first published in what year? Uh, it was like uh, 1980 or 79. 79? Yeah, Seventy nine right. or eighty. I know John was still alive. Um, I was barely. I think it was nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty is the yeah. copy. Eighty. I was fifteen. I was bare. I barely had enough money to buy baseball cards. Yeah. So getting that that vol- I wanted that so bad with the autograph. Beautiful. Number nine one one. How's that? Uh-huh. <laughs> so, but, but every but in the later one, the next two that he did, the lyrics, uh, the. Uh, Songs of George Harrison, volumes one and two, came with the CDs that had, I think, Flying Hour and yeah, and stuff. right. So. Everything that you've been saying, Darren, I've loved. And and in, in looking back, I can certainly agree with you about his catalog being consistently strong. I know there are some fans out there that will not agree with you. The people that like the the more commercial side of George, the ones that like All Things Must Pass and Cloud Nine, and those those are the favorites for them. And they don't like the real serious, preachy George. Yeah. You know, um, they a lot of those same fans will favor a 33 and a third because it's more lighter. It shows his more of a sense of humor. He's not being as serious. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you the thing about George is I've always loved all of his solo albums. But like any other artist, you do recognize certain ones that you think are weaker. For me, I always thought, somewhere in england was one of the weakest of all of his albums yeah and extra texture i love the songs on it there are less songs uh, i'm not that big on his name is legs <laughs> uh as far as a you know a good quality song um but i think with george's stuff it gets stronger over time because right. a lot of what he says in his lyrics are are things that you may not be able to grasp when you're younger and you can relate to them a lot more as you get older so I think his, his music has really grown in stature for me 
Oh, yeah. Even the stuff that I accepted immediately, like all things must pass, I love even more mm-hmm. than I did before. But, you know, living in the material world is, is especially important to me because of songs. If you listen to what he's saying in songs like The Light That Has Lighted the World or Who Can See It or especially Be Here Now, which I think is a very bold statement. You know, it's very much like a mantra, that song. Yeah. Very few words. Each word takes up several measures of the song it's as slow as can be but he doesn't care it's what he's saying in the song it's a prayer yeah it really is a prayer you know it's um in many ways you know a lot of that spirituality was there and all things must pass living in the material world is kind of like all things must pass without the phil specter production except for try some buy some and the songs are lyrically just as powerful, if not more so. Maybe not as commercially appealing. Yes, it had Give Me Love as a, a number one single. Um, and really, Don't Let Me Wait Too Long should have been a single. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's from song to song. And closing with that is all, which I think is one of the most beautiful love songs ever written that was never a single <laughs> and uh, should have been. Uh, I think it would be recognized now as a classic if it was. It's a very slow song as, a, as, a, as love songs go. But, you know, if it had gotten airplay back then, just some minimal airplay, it might be more recognized now and, and uh, more appreciated now as a song. That is all. He's, he's done a lot of great love songs. And what about, uh, so really quick, one more thing about living in the material world. That was really the first time that George was in the producer's chair by Mm. himself. For an album. Well, he, well, he co-produced with, with Phil Spector on. Co-produced. He had Phil around. Right. Of course, George Martin was handling it for the Beatles. Uh, But when George was uh, going off on his own, you know, uh, Phil Spector was there. Uh, but living in the material was the first time where it was almost entirely Harrison's production, and that is a, a gorgeous album. I mean, you don't think so. listen, if, if you're not into the spirituality, do not listen to the lyrics, fine. But there's no denying that that album is uh, um, is just a, a gorgeous record, it sounds perfect. Mm. Uh, the, ah, I agree with you. It's funny, the, the thing about the light that has lighted the world, if you follow what George said in his book, I Me Mine, it was originally written for Scylla Black <laughs> to record because he was relating to the fact that Scylla had become this big star and she wasn't you know, a Liverpool girl anymore and she moved to London. And so if you read the lyrics of it, it's, you can relate to it so much to George about appreciating the people in his life who have accepted the changes in his life, you know, that he's not, you know, just a Beatle anymore. He's moved on. You can interpret it that way, but originally it was written with the intention of Scylla Black doing it. Mm -hmm. But yet it's, it's so powerful the way that it's presented. I love the production. I, he's, he's always had great musicians, you know, Nicky Hopkins has just the right touch for any song, kind of like Billy Preston does. Um, and the piano playing that's on that particular song is so simple and yet so beautiful and just what was needed. You know, same thing with Who Can See It. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a masterpiece of an album, Living in the Material World. But you, you also mentioned, and I always love to say, 33 and a Third and George Harrison back to back, two killer albums. Yeah. The highest quality right there. So. If you listen to his records chronologically, I also just another thing that I really love is as the mid 70s set in is the way he so um, is is how he embraced kind of a, an R&B and soul feel. Yes. Into his music and did it so seamlessly, you know, that, you know, something like. Um, who was the I think it's Willie Weeks plays bass on 33 and a third. Right. I'm not mistaken, you know, and uh, Woman Don't You Cry For Me, the way that kicks off. This mm-hmm. funk number from this guy from England, 
wow, who was just, you know, doing a, just three years earlier, put out his very spiritual living in the material world. And now, you know, he's funk master flex. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, really, I mean, and again, another little subtle thing that, you know, could very easily pass you by. And then you realize, holy smoke, this guy was, uh, you know, had a lot, a lot going on there, but not a lot of attention, not a lot of bells and whistles calling, you know, pointing towards. And there's also the slide is. version of, of that on, uh, it was a bonus track on mm. uh, All, things new, must pass. All Things Must Pass reissue. Um, in fact, yeah. we haven't talked about his slide playing. Um, we should at least acknowledge that um, he had a very distinctive sound as a slide player. You, you, right. could, you could put on a record that he's playing slide on and know instantly yep. that it's him as opposed to Dwayne Allman or any other great slide player. He had, right. he had a tone, he had a, a style, he had a way of phrasing. It, it was, you know, totally George. And, yeah. you know, and that's what you want from a musician. You want them yep. to have an identifiable style and he did they were ringo yep. they, they were similar i always thought the two of them because mm -hmm. they could very easily blend in in the background you not even know they're there mm -hmm. uh yet what they did was so consistently good and and, and almost you know pivotal and irreplaceable and George not only has a sound on slide that is his that is his own, but you often hear other guitar players copying that sound. You know, a George yeah. Harrison sound on slide guitar. Mm -hmm. There is a so, uh, there's a Wilco song, uh, "Impossible Germany," where I, I I think I read I don't remember where I read it a long long time ago, but I had heard it. You could definitely hear that the guys in Wilco are intentionally kind of throwing Harrison, I think it's impossible Germany, throwing Harrison licks around in the song, you know, intentionally like as a way of paying tribute. Yeah. Um, mm. While I'm Sometimes. on that topic, I don't know if either one of you have heard the uh, EP, the, I guess it was the first solo thing that Jim James of My Morning Jack yep. put out, his EP, which was called Tribute To, which was his tribute to George Harrison, which he actually, I think, recorded while George was still alive, just, uh, you know, on the side for fun and put it out after George died. And there's some, if you want covers, listen to that, that EP from Jim James that hmm. is really shows what kind of a strong songwriter, brilliant songwriter George was. That yeah. just popped into my head. I thought I'd share that. So, But that slide sound, I mean, imagine My Sweet Lord without it. Oh yeah, you know what he brought to that, or Cracker Box Palace. So many songs from his from his solo career, in, in particular. But you know, you touched upon the R and B stuff that George was doing. He also mixed in not only R and B but a light jazz yeah. into his albums. I think maybe um, it might have been an influence when he did the Dark Horse album, the first two tracks he recorded with the LA Express. LA Express, yep. You know, I, so definitely. you, yeah. Definitely. So when you get to a song like um, Far East Man, which has a very laid back jazzy feel to it. Yeah. He was doing more of that with say Pure Smokey later on mm -hmm. or Learning How to Love You. Right. Very soft, light jazz that worked really well for him, which you may not notice as much. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's either this is a, this is George's style and I'm used to it, but he explored different genres of music and he made it all work for him. Yeah. Tom Scott's L.A. Express, who also was sort of uh, uh, working with not sort of they were working with Joni Mitchell around that time. Also, yeah, Tom, you know. Tom Scott also co-produced 33 and a third with George. Mm -hmm. So and we should. um we should also acknowledge this one other side of him, which we sort of did in the news, which is uh, film production, handmade films. Oh, yeah. Great mm. little company. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, I, 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 I've seen pretty much all the handmade films. I'm not sure. I think I might be missing one or two that I never could catch up with. But, you know, they were all a little bit off 
what you would expect. You know, they were they were the things that uh, you know may not have been picked up by a more commercial studio, but you could bring the project to George and if, you know, if he liked it, he would do it. And some great stuff. Um, very, very varied catalog. But, you know, we think of um, something like, like how, how Handmade started with um, the life of Brian. You know, um, here is George supposed to be this, you know, big religious guy. And obviously, you know, it's not <laughs> the aspect of religion that he's interested in, but he's willing to give it a chance when they can't get funding for it anyplace else. And this was a, a film that caused a lot of controversy when it came out um, of, you know, um, various churches, uh, you know, doing the usual thing of not going and seeing it, but saying that it's horrible and sacrilegious and, and all of that. And uh, I remember John Cleese going on <laughs> Um, I think the Dick Cavett show uh, and Dick Cavett asked him, you know, what do you think of, um, you know, these, um, you know, churches and, you know, priests and ministers who are uh, inveighing against the life of Brian. And he just said, you know, in a way where the, the timing of the way he put it was just like, these people have made me a very rich man. <laughs> I just love that, uh, you know. But George, George was open to it, and you know the the fact that it was taking a a, a sort of satirical view of uh, you know religion in a way uh, was actually it was really more politics. It was really the politics of Second Temple era Judea, but. Um, you know, uh, then it in included things like Mona Lisa with uh, Bob Hoskins, um, I think before Bob Hoskins was very well known. Um, you know, just a, just a lot of great films, How to Get Ahead in Advertising, I think with Jeff Daniels, um, growing an extra head on his shoulder. Uh, <laughs> prefiguring Bevel Brooks from uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm. Um, so really, you know, if you can, um, I guess there, there are, are there video rental places anymore? Independent stores. Mm -hmm. They're definitely worth seeking out, you know, go on to Wikipedia, get a list of all the handmade films and go through them one by one. And, uh, and I think you'll have a good time. I'm looking yeah. at them right now myself. Mm -hmm. Dig around, you know, in this day and age. You know, with services like Netflix and I mean, Netflix and, uh, you know, things like that. Some of these movies are kind of available out there. You just got to, you know, go digging around. I think not all that long ago, I put on El Topo. Oh, yeah. OK, never. Okay. I just one was messing around with search and I'm like, holy smokes, it's here. Let me see what this was all about. What you think? I fell asleep. Oh, <laughs> Because that's when I, you know, I, it's late at night. I'm messing around with, you know, and I never make it to the end of the movie then. Um, but senior, I'm senior in high school, freshman in college, I must have seen that film 10 times. El Topo? Wow. Yes. There is a Beatles connection. Well, the soundtrack's on Apple. That's right. And that's really what, you know, the come together, the other one in Raga, and, you know, being a huge Pink Floyd fan, I've always got to kind of go back looking around uh, now I have them on disc. So more and, and, and La Valley and Zabriskie point, but I've got my, uh, my uh, handmade films uh, list here. And tonight I must just might just go digging around and seeing what sir, maybe some of these are sitting, you know, in these. Uh... Have you both seen with Nell and I? Only clips of it. Oh, there was the see uh... with Nell and I, I watch with Nell and I once a year. Great film, just a great okay. film. Yeah, there was a great documentary that came out two years ago, mm -hmm. an accidental studio. Yeah, and so there's clips from most of the handmade films. I did see Time Bandits in the movie theater oh, when yeah. it came out because I was waiting for George's song <laughs> with Dream Away. Um, and of course, there's Shanghai Surprise at the same right. time, right. Where George's comment about Madonna was, you know, the, the difficulty with this film is that you have a comedy and an actress without a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as a segue, since we're talking about the many different styles of music that, that George has recorded, you do you do learn about the pre rock and roll stuff 
that George loved. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking about in Shanghai Surprise, there's a song, Hottest Gong in Town, mm -hmm. which is very 1930s, 40s, big band, mm -hmm. uh, that, that type of style. And we know that he loved uh, Hoagie Carmichael oh, yeah. Yeah. from the songs that he covered and Cole Porter with True Love and his love for um, ukulele. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, as well. Um, so this there's a lot there that george dabbled in shouldn't say dabble because he really mastered he became a really good ukulele player too mm -hmm. and uh you know there's a lot more to george and just you know rockers and ballads once yeah. you really do go deep into his catalog it's kind of interesting i mean we've been talking for a bit over an hour and have touched on an awful lot of different sides of George Harrison. And, you know, I, I think we can each guarantee that people who comment on the YouTube page um, or, or Podbean or wherever they're watching this will come up with other things that we've neglected. Um, but, you know, time is not infinite. Um, but it, it really is just amazing how, you know, when you think about George, if you really sit down and, you know, take his work and you know his life in context you know there was an awful lot there given that he was the quiet beetle you know a mm. um, lot of different interests a lot of different endeavors um and most of them you know really successful i mean um, handmade films was not meant to be a you know, blockbuster film company, and it it, it ended up failing for various reasons, um, which we may never get to the bottom of totally. There are, there are different sides of the Dennis O'Brien story, um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, he 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 lived a very interesting life, and uh, I sort of miss having him among us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Absolutely. I think he was a very fascinating person. And I think he was a guy that was an extremist <laughs> in many ways. There are so many different sides to George Harrison. There's the side of him that could be so serious mm -hmm. one moment and then so comical the next and loving Monty Python and the goons and that kind of humor. Um, Peter Sellers, <laughs> you know, Being he loved. Um, what's that? <laughs> being in the Ruddles film. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He loved being there. I know he said Peter Sellers film a lot. He was the guy that loved gardening one minute and then something as dangerous as race car driving the next. Mm -hmm. You know, there's yep. there's all these different sides to George. And, um, you know, I think he's someone that when it came to music, he discovered early on that, you know, just having hit records and having success is not what it's all about. And I think that he, he always loved making music. That was never a problem. And he had his own recording studio. And I hope that we get to learn what other stuff is in the vaults from the Harrison estate, because there was a quote that George gave um, to Timothy White, I think it was, when the Yellow Submarine song track came out, that he's got more unreleased stuff than Jim Reeves. Um, so I don't know how much Jim Reeves has of unreleased music, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't know if that means unreleased songs that he's written. I don't know if that means all that it takes of songs that he's, the, he's already released, but I do hope we get to hear that, but he didn't care that much about record sales. I mean, if he had moderate success, he was happy with it. He didn't like really promoting his stuff all that much. He only really gave interviews because he had to. Same thing with videos. I mean, he did everything on his own terms, ultimately. But, um, you know, he was happy to make music and put out music that was satisfying to him first. And if we all dug it, fine. If not, he can live with it, you know? Mm. Yeah, it's been a long 20 years, a darker 20 years without yeah. it. Mm. Definitely. You know, what's really interesting is that, like I just said, he lived on his own terms. The last time George released his own solo album, apart from um, 
you know, best of Dark Horse or, or live in Japan and the Traveling Wilburys. The last album was Cloud Nine. And that came out in 1987. And George died in 2001. And we have no idea had, had George lived, would he ever have released another album again? Because that's a long stretch. Yeah. <laughs> that's longer than the five years between Gon Trapo and Cloud Nine and the five years that John took as well. Mm-hmm. So, but I have no doubt that he was always recording, you know, whenever he felt like doing it. But I'm very grateful that we got to hear Brainwashed. Right. You know, many of the songs he worked on towards the end cobbled with some other older songs. But um, it, it's kind of interesting, you know, in, in a way you admire someone that does what he feels like, you know, and doesn't care that much about, you know, whether he's on the charts, whether he's number one, whether he's got a comeback or whatever, you know, he lived on his own terms. You knew how he felt just by what he did or what he chose not to do. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the beautiful things about the Beatles. I mean, John took those five years off because it was important to him to do that. I don't know if he knew it would be five years or it could have been 10 years. We don't really know but they did what they wanted to do. Uh, everything that they've done, all four of them, is because they wanted to do it. Right. Whether it's releasing music, new music, or touring. But, um, and uh, certainly with George, he lived his life that way. Okay. So let us um, go around and give our um, contact information. And we'll start with Ken. You can reach me by email at everylittlething at att.net. I have my other uh, talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which is every other Monday night um, on our brand new, well, I shouldn't say brand new. It's our YouTube channel, but we're now broadcasting live on YouTube. We were doing it on Facebook. Now it's actually on YouTube. And our next show is actually going to be, because we're taking a break with uh, the new year coming up on uh, January the 10th. So there'll be new shows starting um, next month. And I also have my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, where I just did a brand new interview with Bruce Spicer and Al Sussman. Bruce has just put out his latest book, which usually coincides with the archival box sets that have come out, not in this particular case, but um, it's for Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine. We talk at length about really everything that followed the Sgt. Pepper album through the Yellow Submarine film and album without talking about the White Album, because he already did that in the previous book. And Al Sussman has been contributing articles for each of his books from Sgt. Pepper on, um, because there have been books, they're kind of, they're they're like companion pieces to the archival box sets in a way Mm -hmm. for Sgt. Pepper, The White Album, Abbey Road, and Let It Be, and now with Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine. So that's the latest interview that I've done that's on uh, my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. Don't forget, I do have my own website, kenmichaelsradio.com, and you've got Beatles Trivia, there every single week where you can win one of 10 great prizes and there'll be a special contest starting probably at the end of this week where you can win a copy of this book it's all in the mind we had the two authors here on our show laura courtner and dr bob who i should be interviewing on my youtube channel this week more of a continuation of what we covered here on our show and I'm giving away a copy of this book with a whole bunch of memorabilia stuff that uh, Laura and Dr. Bob have been kind enough to send me to give away of yellow submarine stuff. So that'll be on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. And I think that's it. All right. Darren? If you want to send me an email personally to my uh, uh, WFUV email address, by all means, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, Darren DeVivo is one page. The other one uh, has a little bit of a longer name to it, but Darren DeVivo is in there. So if you did a search, um, 
you'll find it and I'll invite you to the, whichever page you join, I'll invite you over to the other one. And if you want to check me out on WFUV, WFUV uh, is in New York City, 90.7 FM uh, and 90.7 FM HD2. Um, we stream on our website, WFUV.org, so you don't have to be in New York City, um, be anywhere, not on the planet, though, you have to be on Earth. Uh, you can get our app, download our app and listen there. Uh, and I'm on the air Monday through Thursday night, starting at 10 p.m. and Saturday afternoons from uh, 1 to 4 p.m. And uh, if you go to WFUV.org and you, and you dig around on the website, uh, you could find uh, my top, <laughs> supposed to be 10, my top 25 albums of and songs, I think 15 songs of 2021 amongst the staff's picks as we're doing our uh, annual year-end listener poll, uh, which I believe is still going on. We can vote for your favorites and then uh, check out our picks and mine are up there um, as well. Something, you know, bathroom reading for you. So there you go. <laughs> okay, and for me, um, you can find me on Facebook. I have two pages, Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, Remixed has more Beatles stuff. Plain old Alan Cozen has more, you know, classical or other stuff. Um, but look at either one. Um, send me a note if you want to, or you can write to all of us at by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed which is at things we said fab. We have two more Facebook pages for the group. Things We Said Today, easy enough, and Things We Said, it, said Today, Beatles radio fans. You can find the podcasts. Um, you know, these days the preferred one is YouTube because it's video. Um, and, uh, you know, not that you necessarily want to look at us, but you can see me holding up my copy of I Me Mine and George's autograph, you know, need these things. Um, and also Podbean and um, iTunes and other places that find podcasts are found. So um, this was uh, a lot of fun for me, um, you know, just having a, a, an opportunity to think closely about George Harrison and, and his various legacies and, uh, you know, what he's done, what we've heard, what ideally we can look forward to at some point um, to hear more of it, which I hope happens. Um, yeah, so... For Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye.